Hi. <laughs> so today you're going to get a demonstration of a full end-to-end uh, -end, uh, cloud collection and analysis pipeline for the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and you'll also see how to merge that data with forensic information from desktop and non-cloud platforms as well. Uh, as well as that demo, you'll also get here an exciting story about a forensic investigation uh, and have a highly buzzword compliant experience. Uh, we're going to be talking about Internet of Things, cloud, cyber, blockchain, and DevOps. Uh, strap in, it's going to be amazing. You may be wondering who we are. We've already heard um, a little bit about us, but a couple of other. One fact I really want to share is that Tom had a pet capybara and then he ate it. Um, you know what a capybara is? Uh, you look one up, they're very cute. It's a rodent, but a very cute rodent. So this is us, we're gonna be telling you the story today. Uh, and Tom has Twitter, I'm not cool enough for Twitter. Okay, before we get too much further, uh, this is a story. The characters are fictional. The organizations are fictional. The hacking is semi-fictional. Please don't go telling your friends about how you heard about this amazing real thing that happened. Um, you'll be wrong and you'll feel sad. So this whole thing is fictional but based on experiences that we've had or near misses that we've had as well. Now for any good story, you need great characters. I want to introduce some characters now. So the main subject of our uh, investigation today is gonna to be a Greendale Polytechnic. They're a uh, small for-profit educational institution located uh, near Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, and they specialize in teaching air conditioning. Uh, and despite a few setbacks, uh, they've managed to set up a really good educational program uh, for bringing air conditioning to Switzerland, because there isn't any there at the moment. And also telling people what air conditioning is and, and how to use it. They've had some setbacks, but they're doing all right now. Um, a couple of people that work there, uh, Vadim, he's in charge of the sc overall school, um, in charge of the whole thing, but also is a very keen computer enthusiast, loves dabbling in technology, um, and it's always great when the head of a, an organization feels that they know a lot about technology and want to get involved. Uh, and he's got a new hire, well actually a, a rehire, uh, Benjamin Chang, a former employee of Greendale uh, who left under some less than great circumstances, but he's back now uh, and everything's going to be great. He's retrained as a cloud specialist, so he now knows many things about cloud and he's been brought in to help set up the uh, infrastructure for Greendale's new Internet of Things air conditioning class. So that's Greendale, that's the Dean and Ben. Um, and they also have a managed security service provider, uh, and they're called CFA. Uh, they've been working with Greendale for a lot of years now. Uh, if you've been to previous OSDF cons, you might have heard some of the stories of things they've experienced together. Uh, and Ahmed uh, is now their senior consultant from CFA who works with Greendale. Uh, and Rosa is a relatively new member of the CFA team, and she's been shadowing Ahmed and learning the ropes. So we've got the characters. Um, it's time to get into the story. So, as I mentioned, uh, Ben recently joined Greendale. He's their cloud expert, and he's been setting up the infrastructure for Greendale's new internet-connected air conditioners. He's been diligently working around this, doing a pretty good job, uh, but then one day, he gets an alert about really high billing, like really high costs on his, uh, on his cloud project that he's been setting up, and he's like, well, what is this? What could this be? And he has a look and sees, and sees this graph, um, what, what this is kind of showing is a whole bunch of instances, like new virtual machines starting up on his um, cloud project, and they're instantly 100% CPU, almost instantly 100% CPU. So that's, that's pretty weird. He doesn't know why that would happen. He has a look at this um, page, which shows all the instance names and a bit of data about them. Uh, and they've all got sort of default names. Like this instance one, instance number thing is sort of the default naming scheme. So this is weird. Um, he doesn't know of why the, all these virtual machines would have been created, and he thinks it's probably hackers. I mean, it's a natural conclusion. Uh, so he contacts Ahmed at CFA and says, please help, have a security problem. Um, for all their many um, positive qualities, Greendale have never really been great at uh, communication or keeping CFA in the loop about their new products and developments. Um, and this is the first that Ahmed has heard about this whole cloud thing. So he that brings up certain feelings, uh, but he pushes them down. He's very professional and, uh, and gets started. So the good news is that CFA have a bunch of other clients uh, who are already living in the cloud, already doing GCP things. And uh, Ahmed 
uh, knows what to do, has set up the response. He also has some ideas about theories about what might have happened here. If you've done some of these cases, maybe you do as well. But for getting ahead of himself a bit, so let's, uh, let's jump into setting up the environment. So the first thing he wants to do is set up a, an environment to do his response in. He doesn't want to do all the forensics inside Greendale's cloud project because maybe there are hackers there, maybe they're going to interfere with, um, with what he's trying to do. So he's going to set up a, a brand new project and put all his tools there. Uh, and the tools that he wants, that CFA use, uh, time sketch, uh, which you heard about this morning. It's a, a tool for doing logs analysis and visualization. Uh, he, wants, he wants that set up. He wants Turbinia set up. So Turbinia is a, a processing framework for do, uh, running workloads in the cloud, doing sort of bulk forensic processing in the cloud. And so he wants the server that orchestrates everything and a bunch of workers that actually do the processing. He wants all that. Uh, and then he wants like some nice way to manipulate that, get data in and out. And for that, he wants TimeWolf. Time Wolf is sort of a glue code and a bunch of things for moving data in and out of uh, different, different forensic environments. So what he wants, and the other thing that he knows, which is really handy for him, is that um, there's a project called Forseti that is for um, sort of community contributions for doing security stuff on GCP. And there's a pre-canned environment there uh, that he can just click and run, uh, and it'll set everything up for him. So let's see that. Hopefully, I, nope, wrong side. Cool. So this is what it looks like. This is the, the cloud platform. He launches a shell. There's a built-in shell thing in the platform. It's got some stuff preloaded. It has the Forseti repository checked out. Um, and he goes in and starts things up. So Terraform is the tool that actually applies the configuration to the project. It basically says, um, you, you give it a desired configuration and what the project turn looks like, and then it works out what it needs to do and sets it all up. So he goes through, runs the thing. Um, now it's going to ask him what project he wants to terraform, turn into this uh, response environment. Does the things. Uh, it says what it's going to do, but he just approves that. He has done this a hundred times before. And it goes through and starts setting up new VMs. So um, here we can see Turbinia appearing. Uh, the worker starting up. More things happening behind the scenes. Uh, and then you see Elasticsearch, which is a dependency for time sketch. And then in the end, he has all these services running. Uh, setting this up isn't like super hard or anything, but it, it takes a lot longer than like the 30 seconds for the script to run. You have to configure a bunch of things, tell Tubinia where time sketch is, tell Time Wolf where Tubinia is, all that stuff. But it's all done uh, for him with the script. So he's got the environment set up, he's ready to rock. Time to get started. So um, there are lots of good security practices in, in um, for doing things on various clouds. Greendale didn't seem to have read the material all that well. Uh, there's great ways to like export logs and have it all set up, but uh, they never thought it would happen to them, which is a strange assumption, but it's one they made. Uh, so what Ahmed needs to do is talk to the, sort of the default logging stuff. This is called Stackdriver. It has uh, logs of like every request that's made to the API, make a new VM here, add a new account, that sort of stuff. So he's going to do that, um, but it's kind of a pain. The interface is a bit difficult to use, uh, but luckily for him, well, not so much luckily, pre-planned for him, uh, Time Wolf is pretty good at this. So it can connect to Stackdriver, grab the logs that are required, and has a pre-canned query, it massages them a bit, uh, and then puts those logs into into time sketch where you can analyze it. Wait, I'll make it analyze it more easily. This is what the command line looks like. It's pretty boring to watch, so we'll skip straight to the, uh, the results. So he runs this, gets some logs. They look kind of like this. Um, and he takes a look at it, and he's, his assumptions, he's pretty sure he knows what's going on here. So he sees that this account has been, uh, this VM has been created by uh, this super admin account uh, here, and the uh, You've got the requesting IP, the IP address that made the request to the API. This is another cloud provider. Um, and he's like, oh, and 100% CPU. I, and it, all these are made the same. It's exactly the same call over and over again, same account, same IP address, right after each other. He, he goes, I, I better know what this is. This is uh, someone at Greendale has got very excited about the cloud, wants to do some stuff, and they've made a service account for accessing the API and doing stuff. 
Uh, they've started playing around with it, and then they've somehow put it on the internet. Uh, they've put it in a Git repository, or put it on Pastebin, or some other interesting way of leaking this on the internet, and then some bot has come through and found it, I bet. He spends about 30 seconds on uh, GitHub and finds this, where our, our enthusiastic dean has been trying to learn Python and Google Cloud, and he's put the service account key there so he can access it, and he's pushed it to GitHub, um, and then a Bitcoin or Monero mining bot has come along, found the key, and then issued a bunch of automated requests to start the, uh, start the things. He's, he's, he's like, well, this always generates an alert to the owners, but I guess Greendale didn't get the memo, didn't read the message, uh, and just freaked out. He's like, well, I've seen this 100 times before, or at least 10, um, but Rosa, she's new, she hasn't really uh, had, had one of these yet, so it'd be good for her to learn on that. So Rosa, like, here's the case, just, can you just confirm what I think has happened here, uh, and just do an audit, see what this um, super admin account has been up to. Um, should be straightforward, off you go. Rosa's keen and ready to get into it. So off she goes. Um, does that, it looks pretty much like Ahmed said to her, um, but then she notices something else in the stack driver logs that's a little bit weird. Not, not super weird, but a little bit weird. She sees this pattern of things, I'll blow this up in a sec, um, that Ben Chang's account was used to issue a couple of commands in sequence. This is the bottom four here. Uh, it was used to set some metadata on an instance and then reboot that instance straight away. So this is like setting some platform stuff on a virtual machine and then restarting it. And like there's a chance this is like setting up a backdoor because what, one of the metadata things you can set is a startup script that the instance will run when it reboots. But this is probably fine. I mean, Chang's you know, playing around with stuff. How bad could it be? She takes a quick look here. Uh, at, at one of these requests, just clicking on the thing in, um, in time sketch, and you get a full view. Uh, and she sees a couple of things that stand out as a bit weird. Um, so this, this is the user agent string that uh, the API recorded when the request was made. And the two things that stand out to her are, this is a G Cloud SDK, so this is the command line version of the API access. And it's using this Microsoft, Linux um, user agent, and that's a, that's a bit weird. She just hasn't heard anything of, like that before, but um, maybe he's just learning things. His normal user agent is this one, uh, which is what you get when you're clicking things in the, in the console, not running things on the command line. But you know, this, this Chang guy is new, maybe he's learning some stuff, he's playing around. It's probably fine. Um, but maybe it's worth, she's like, well, since I'm here, I may as well check the whether there was a startup script set for this Jenkins thing. It's like one command, how bad could it be? Um, it's not gonna take a minute or two. This is the startup script uh, that she sees, and it, it, straight away she's like, oh, maybe this is bad, because like, echoing a bunch of base64 to the shell on boot, that's, that's super sketchy. Uh, I'll just obfuscate that and see what it is. Uh, it's this, uh, so this is, uh, downloading a binary from some server, grendale.xyz, maybe you may remember this from this morning, thanks, Kitty. Um, and then making executable and then running it. This is, this is almost certainly a backdoor. This is super bad. Um, you've got to get to the bottom of this. And, and she can't really go any further with the API logs. All she has at the moment is the stack driver logs and you know, a bit of stuff from the API. It's not really enough to go forward with. She wants some more evidence. And the next obvious step is to look at this Jenkins machine and see what's been going on there. Uh, but Jenkins is in the cloud. So how are we gonna get, how is she gonna get the, um, the uh, get an image of this thing in the cloud? Time Wolf again is probably a good option. Um, so just explain this briefly, we have at the top Greendale Internet of Things uh, project where all the air conditioning control stuff lives and Jenkins lives. And then below that, we have the CFA incident response project where all the tools are to do all the processing. So she runs TimeWolf and TimeWolf says, please copy the Jenkins, or take a snapshot of the Jenkins disk. Jenkins is still running, but take a snapshot of the disk uh, and just copy it for me. And then, she tell, and then TimeWolf tells uh, Turbinia, hey, you have a disk, go process it run all the things, run strings, run Plazo, 
etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. In case you're not aware, Plazo is a, a timelining extraction tool that extracts like metadata and logs and stuff and puts it into a, a consumable bundle for time sketch. Uh, and then Time Wolf um, gets a, back a copy of that and puts it into Time Sketch. This is all one command. This is just one command. She runs like Time Wolf. I forget the recipe name. GCP Forensics. GCP Forensics. Oh. Handy. Um, and then the instance name, and then it does all these things. Takes a little while, of course, to process the image. So while that's happening, uh, she gets on the phone to uh, to Ben at Greendale, and is like, "Hey, I see your machine doesn't have any of our endpoint agents on it." Did, did they forget to install them? Did they forget to like do that because you're a new employee? He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but I'm happy to help. And she's like, okay, well, Greendale's IT management again, getting on my nerves. Uh, but I have a solution. We can take an image of your, um, of your laptop, put it in the cloud, we can process it all together. And then in time sketch, she can layer together the stack driver logs, the Jenkins uh, timeline, and then the timeline from Cheng's computer uh, and see what's going on. So uh, we have a tool for doing this. It's called the Gift Stick. It's a bootable USB operating system with some other magic baked into it. Um, it looks like this. So the first thing you'll see in the bottom uh, is a USB drive going in, uh, and then the machine boots up. Uh, the Gift is based on Exubuntu, so you'll see the Exubuntu splash screen. There it is. Uh, and there's one button, it says Forensicate. Uh, and you double click, but Chang double clicks that. Uh, and then this window pops up and stuff just starts happening. Uh, what it's doing is copying the image up to the cloud. It's also dumped all the firmware off the machine as well. It uses Chipsec to do that. Uh, puts it all in the cloud where the response team can look at it. Uh, this is really handy for places where you might have IT personnel, but maybe not security personnel. Um, Chang isn't a security person, quite clearly, but he can boot a USB drive, um, click a button, and it can all happen. So that's cool. Um, and then uh, it's time to start analyzing this data, and I'll pass over to Tom to explain what happened, what Rosa does next. Thanks. So now we want to know what exactly happened. And we're halfway into this presentation, and we already spotted two incidents, or at least one and a half, right? So. The first one is a bunch of instances, VM instances were created uh, and started mining uh, some kind of cryptocurrency. This triggered the CPU signals or at least the billing alert, which alerted Ben. Um, ben called a CFA to try to check out like what was going on. And CFA found other stuff, uh, Rosa namely found like this weird startup script on the Jenkins VM, which seems to be a bit more uh, involved than just Bitcoin mining. Um, so this is what they know so far. And the evidence that they have is a bunch of API logs. So these are all the stack driver logs that they got in the first run with, of uh, Time Wolf. They also have a Jenkins VM that they have uh, copied. Whoa. What happened? Jenkins VM that they copied from uh, the cloud. And they have Ben's workstation timeline that they used after the gift stick uploaded all his uh, disk images to the cloud. So she has everything he needs. She needs uh, Rosa has everything she needs in time sketch to continue digging. So she starts back with the metadata change uh, events, and it's pretty handy because time sketch. Whenever you upload a new piece of evidence, it will color it differently. So in this case, you have the purple. The purple colors are for the stack driver logs, and the blue colors are for B Chang's uh, computer. B Chang is Ben Chang. Um, so she sees that around the time where uh, the metadata was changed, some bash.exe file was run on uh, Ben's computer. So she doesn't know much about what bash.exe is. She knows bash, she knows cmd.exe, but bash.exe, that's kind of unusual. But she does a quick search online and she finds that this might be indicative of the usage of the WSL, so the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, which might also explain why uh, Ahmed spotted the user agent being Windows, Linux, something, something. Uh, it's kind of unusual, but you know, so far it could be it could be something beneath. But she still wants to look at events that happened before that. So, looking at other executions in there, she finds that Plazo located a prefetch file for 
uh, cmd.exe, so she knows that one. Um, and she sees that the prefetch files are indicative of process execution on Windows. And they had this cool thing where they, they store all the files that were loaded by the PE when it, when it was loaded. So in this case, she sees that nvtelemetry.bat uh, was loaded by command.exe. And this is coming from a directory in, under app data uh, called unistore. You can see everything there, I think, in all caps. So app data is a good place for malware to hide because it's hidden from the normal user activities. It's hidden like in, the, in their home directory. And it's also writable by the user with no need of extra privileges. So she's like, well, this Unistore directory is a little bit weird. Let's focus on that. So she pivots on this, uh, this directory. And what she sees is a reference to a bunch of other uh, prefetch executions and also nc64.exe, uh, which she doesn't know, but she knows of a command called netcat that's usually seen in Unix systems and also is available for Windows. Could be something bad, it could be nothing. Uh, but what's a bit more worrying is the first line on there is a um, registry key modification time. So, and this registry key is the current user's run key in Windows. And again, this is a really classic malware uh, target when they want to achieve persistence uh, because it's writable by any user, in this case it's the HK current user hive. So this can be written by any user with no need of extra privileges and it's also used by a bunch of other system uh, services. So if you write your startup key there, chances are you'll be undetected for a while. So next thing that she does is she wants to figure out what happened around that time from the registry key creation to like later on and she sees a bunch of nc64.exe commands. She sees command.exe being executed. Uh, who am I? A free fetch file for who am I, which is indicative of like recon from an attacker. So she starts to be really worried, as you can see in her avatar on there. <laughs> she starts to be like, ah, oh, well, this is this is probably a bit a bit bad. Uh, WSL host confirms the usage of uh, WSL on there. Um, so now she's like, all right, I, I really need to figure out where this nc64.exe file came from. So she goes back a bit to the creation time of that file, and what she sees is a couple of events that happened before that that are really useful to figure out what happened here, namely the creation date of an invoice.pdf.lnk file. And so Rosa has worked on a bunch of ransomware cases before, and she knows that LNK files are a very good way to deliver this kind of malware, right? Um, all you have to do is trick the user into opening what looks to be a PDF, and in fact, the LNK file will summon another command um, that has nothing to do with a PDF, unfortunately. <laughs> so looking a bit up at browsing history, if she wants to figure out how the, how the file got in there, she sees that, well, Ben was browsing on webmail.greendale.xyz and he downloaded an attachment from there. So following up that chain of events, one could assume that uh, Ben was fished, or at least he received an email saying, hey, you have to pay this invoice. It's probably really urgent that you do it right now. At least open it and figure out what's inside. And I guess Ben was disappointed when he opened it because not, nothing much must have been displayed. Also, if you see the emojis, in the first lines, there's a sleepy emoji, which means that this happened around outside working hours. So Ben must have been, you know, kind of sleepy, didn't pay attention to what was going on, just opened the thing, and boom, he got on. So what Rosa wants now is to figure out what, what was in this LNK file. She could get it from the disks, but Plazo has a parser for LNK files, and it can parse the contents of it, and this is what she gets. So I know this is like the fifth time today that you see Base64, and I'm sorry for that, but it was the simplest encryption mechanism we found. Uh, so yeah, the attacker's phone. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> of course. Uh, and in this case, you see like PowerShell invocation from an LNK file that masquerades as PDF file. Uh, it's Base64 encoded. It has all the nasty flags you may want. It has hidden exec bypass everything. Rosa at this point is pretty freaked out. As you can see, she decodes the payload. And what does she find? Another download and execute script. This time it's PowerShell invoking Python, importing URL lib and downloading this blob from somewhere and executing it. Probably more uh, Python code. 
So at this point, Rosa's pretty happy, right? Because she was tasked with finding some lousy Bitcoin miner, and she ends up finding you know, some more advanced attacker. Uh, so she's pretty happy, but she looks at the Jenkins VM to try to find more signs of attacker activity, and she doesn't find anything, which makes her sad. Um, because you know she doesn't have the full picture of the incident, and she knows that something's missing. So she goes back to Ahmed, and Ahmed looks also terrified by what they found. Um, so they both decide to give Greendale a call and be like, all right, Greendale, what's up with this? Uh, you need to explain what's going on, and someone clearly was after Ben. They compromised him. We found him because there was a metadata change, uh, executions of CMD, and uh, NC64 around that time, and then we pivoted on the creation date of those files. We found that Ben had got fished. So what gives, what can Ben do from this computer uh, that other people can't? And Ben goes like, oh, yeah, sure. This is the computer that I used to like push code to like the bioreactor. It's like, what? What bioreactor? Well, this bioreactor. This is something that, you know, the Greendale, the medicine uh, wing of the Greendale University uses, and they were looking for you know, cheap air conditioning, and you know, Greendell was like beta testing this IoT stuff, so they were like, yeah, sure, have ours, but it's not production ready. Yeah, that's fine, don't worry about it. Um, so they go a bit further and they explain how code ends up on the, affecting the bioreactor. So what you can see here is basically a bunch of Greendell developers can push code to the cloud Git repo, and this Git repository uh, feeds code into the Jenkins uh, continuous integration and deployment uh, engine. So what this means is Jenkins is gonna, every time something is pushed to the repo, Jenkins is gonna grab that code and it's gonna build a bunch of Kubernetes nodes that it's gonna push to production. Um, and so you can see there the worker nodes and the worker nodes are gonna act basically as command and control servers for all the IoT AC units that are cooling down the bioreactor. So, you know, messing, messing with that could, you know, potentially mean bad things happening to the bioreactor. And Rosa, who's like on the phone call and wants to know how this story ends, goes in there, checks for any references to any Git repositories on Ben's computer. She finds this HVAC IoT production repo that has like a .git directory. And again, it's under app data. Mm, that's a bit strange, so she asks Ben, if he knows about this repo, and Ben's like, well, I did clone this repo, but not there. I would never clone it there, and that kind of makes sense, because AppData is not really easily accessible from like user land explorers things. Um, so she decides to dig a bit further, see if attackers may have tampered with the code in there. She spots that hvacserver.py has a last modified date that's really close to the weird activity she's been seeing. Um, so she turns to the Git repo and see if what changes were pushed, and what's the last commit. And this is what she sees. So right off the bat, she sees that the, you probably can't see this, but the commit message, or the commit author, is bchang, where Ben usually uses Ben Chang as an identity. So that's a bit strange at first. But what's even weirder is this new function that was added there, check maintenance mode. Um, so what this does is it checks the data variable for uh, maintenance mode, uh, key, and if it finds it, it sets the AC on to that variable. But then she looks at the code, and it turns out that the code never uses a maintenance mode key, so that statement always returns false, and that effectively deactivates the, the AC on variable. And she sees that this, there's like a time condition on there. So Rose is American, she knows that Americans like to tamper with dates. Uh, Greendell is in Switzerland, so they probably use normal dates. Um, so she translates this, this into like a timestamp, and it turns out that's, that's like tomorrow, right? Just in time. Just in time. Just in time, she averted the disaster that she thought would happen, and she feels really happy about this. She reverts the code, and everything ends well. And that's the end of our story. We have a few closing credits for you. So these are the tech participants for SETI. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, is a open source uh, framework to secure your cloud GCP projects. Also helps you spin up a, an emergency incident response infrastructure if you need one. Uh, Timewolf, which is 
the glue between all the tools, if you want to shove it, data, back and forth between the tools and APIs, Tom Wolf is the tool for you. Trebinia and Plazo, Trebinia, which is like an orchestrator in the cloud, and in this case, we saw it orchestrating a bunch of Plazo workers to process all that evidence. Plazo is like a recursive parser that will extract timestamp information from files. The gift stick, which is basically your remote DD to the cloud. That's a cool buzzword. Uh, the demo featuring our in-house hand model, thanks. Uh, and TimeSketch has a shiny new logo, is a visual timeline analysis tool that was demoed a bit earlier today as well. This is a slide where you can take pictures if you want because it has all the links that you need. Um, I can put it back on later, but we have a few closing credits uh, for this story. And if you have any questions, we'll take them down. Thanks. Yes, the, sli the slides will be online. Um, this is also recorded, I think, so there'll be a recording as well. Put back this one here. But people still love taking photos, so yeah. we made this. Look at that. It works. Huh? <laughs> yep. You should ask him. He's right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was, is there any kind of documentation about this workflow outside of this presentation? And I think the answer is no. Well, it's like there, there's tool documentation, right? But not, not about all this. But this will I be mean, online, so. The, the Forseti stuff will set up most of this for you uh, as well. But I think we were gonna get some extra uh, information from a, a, one of the developers of one of these tools. Go ahead, Jan. So he, he just said that the documentation for Forseti would be published and yeah, you should use that. Any other questions? Nope, all right. Cool. Thanks very much for listening to our story.